All right. Thanks for coming out. Um, so I don't think we have one of those guys who introduces me, so I'll just go ahead. Um, we're going to talk about uh, database optimization for web developers. So um, I'm assuming most of you here are web developers and want to know how to optimize your database. Uh, just a little about me. Uh, I've been working with, uh, I've been a web developer, a DBA, system administrator. I've kind of done everything. So I've, I, I've, uh, I guess I've, I've kind of gotten a, a different perspective on uh, database optimization than your typical web developer. Um, I've kind of seen it from both sides. And so I'm able to, you know, because of that, able to maybe help you guys out a little bit with this. Um, just stuff I've done. Uh, nothing, nothing particularly earth shattering. I haven't worked for any big companies or anything. So uh, why does database optimization matter? Because you don't want to have a slow web page load, right? So what slows down your web page? Now, there are things, you know, content load time, so your CSS, your images, stuff like that is going to slow down your web page. JavaScript runtime, Flash will slow down your web page. Uh, poorly optimized code. Um, I've had two or three times in my career where poorly optimized code made a significant difference in page load time. One was a guy who it took a page took about 10 seconds to load because it was instantiating an ob it did a select star on a on a table and then instantiated an object for each field in each row and yeah that wasn't a good idea um, with hundreds of thousands of rows imagine that um, another time was a regular expression gone wrong that was that was bad uh, but generally if your page is loading slowly, loading slowly, the problem is going to be uh, database queries. That's usually kind of, you know, Rasmus talked about that this morning in his, his keynote, that you know, what they've done with PHP is try to make that kind of problem the database's problem where it belongs. Um, but databases are generally going to be uh, your slowdown. If your website is slow, it's probably that. Is that your experience? I assume you're here because you want to help make your websites faster. So has everyone had that experience where you got some, you know, and so a lot of times it'll work great on your, you know, your little dev box or whatever because you've got six rows, you know, six users in your user table and, oh, it performs great. And then you put it out on your production server and all of a sudden things don't work so well because you got 100,000 rows and, you know, your query, you thought was working great just isn't so great anymore. Um, so every web developer that I've ever talked to knows that if, if your query isn't running fast enough, all you have to do is add another index, right? So um, <laughs> that's, that's true a lot of the time. So here we have a, uh, now I'm going to use the explain statement. I'm using MySQL. Um, well, technically MariaDB, so shout out to MariaDB back there. Um, but uh, with MySQL, there's uh, the explain command. You just put that in front of a query and it'll tell you how the uh, database optimizer plans to execute that query. So getting to understand the explain command will help you a lot in being able to optimize your database queries. So here, um, we're looking at this explain command. We've got select count star from payment, where payment date is greater than or equal to you know, May 1st, 2005, but less than June 1st, 2005. So we're looking for how many payments are there in that month. Um, this, uh, I'm using the, it's a test database, test data that you can, you can get online and do this kind of uh, you can download that, import it into your MySQL database, and then you can 
uh, just play around with different kinds of things without messing up any, any real data. So when you look here, the important fields that you're looking at are down here, the, the key you see is null. That means it didn't find a key to use. So it said, well, I, I don't know. And then you look at rows. And rows tells you, now that's how many rows there are in that table. So that means that we're going to check every row in this table looking for ones that have that. Now the slow part of databases is the disk. So anytime you're reading a whole table, you have to get everything off the disk for that whole table. Yes? Yes, but not by very much. Yes. However, where you'll run into problems is that your key will be larger, and so it'll take more space on disk, yeah. and less of it will fit in memory. And so depending on the size of your database, um, ideally yeah. you want to have enough RAM for your entire database to fit in memory. So um, if, if nothing else, you should have all of your indexes in memory. And uh, you'll run it. I actually did a long time ago when I was a, a student for one of my projects that um, I, I did a comparison looking at key, that specific thing and integers. Um, you you kind of, the performance was very similar up until you ran out of memory. And then the performance for the, the longer one dropped off significantly. And we'll talk about how to deal with that a little later. But. Okay. Is there any kind of hashing algorithm like you take and you use on that key, which I think you use not, and then maybe reduce it to a size of 10 characters, but have enough combination to ensure. We're going to talk about that later. But I would love to know. <laughs> I mean, yep. Like yeah, I've got, I've got some slides about hash indexes Perfect. and how to do that. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. So here, so here we have a, a table, no index. For, the, for our where clause, where we're trying to get this, there's no index for it to use. And so it's using the whole table, or looking at the whole table. Um, now we add an index on payment date. And my thing stops working. This happened the other day, too. Clearly. Okay, we'll do this. Um, all right, so uh, now we're going to, uh, we run that same query, or explain that same query, and now you'll see in the key, it says it's gonna use the payment date key, and our rows is down to 11.55, which because that's what it's selecting on, that's actually how many rows we're gonna return. So it's only looking at the rows it really needs. Um, so that's kind of what we're, we're aiming for is to reduce, when we're using indexes, what we're trying to do is reduce how many rows it has to look at on the disk, because that's a really expensive part of using a database. So if you had, um, if you wanted the ability to search on pretty much everything in that table, would you create an index for every field in that table? Would you use those? Yes or no. Cool. And we'll talk about that too. <laughs> um, it's, it's not that simple. Um, 
and we'll talk a little bit about what indexes are and when they're useful. So in this case, if we did the same query, but we did it by saying where month payment date equals five, you know, in some ways you could say that, well, that's easier. You know, we're just saying where the month is five. That's, you know, we don't have to figure out, you know, what full date stamps to use. However, it has to calculate that for every, so not our, only are we looking up every single row, it's also calculating a month on every single row. So we're adding additional stuff. So just because you have an index, if you're not doing something, um, if you do something like this, it won't be able to use that index because it has to manipulate that data. So when are indexes used? Uh, the leftmost part of the index um, has to be specified for it to be used. So in that last example, you know, we were dealing with a date, and so the date is formatted year, month, day. Um, if you give it a month and a day, but not a year, then the index is useless. You think of it like a, um, a phone book. The phone book is ordered by last name, first name, right? If I want to look up my friend named Bob, and I don't know his last name, how useful is my phone book? It's going to take, am I going to have to look through the entire phone book, right? You know, even if he had a very unique first name, that there, he was the only one in the entire phone book with that first name, so I could potentially find him. It wouldn't matter, you know, I'd have to look through every single page of that phone book until I found him. So that's not something we really want to do uh, most of the time. So the leftmost part of that index, if you can't get the leftmost part, the rest of it doesn't matter. Unless you specify that, you can't, you know, it's just, it's just not able to use anything additional. Um, so, again, if you have multiple columns in your index, so if a single index with multiple columns, it's going to go left to right. So again, like the phone book, you have last name and then first name. And so if you specify a last name and a first name, you can very quickly look it up. If you specify a last name and the first couple characters of the first name, you can still look it up very quickly. If you specify the first couple characters of the last name and then a first name, you're going to have to do a lot of looking, right? Um, so indexes can't be used after a range. So if you say, like if you say the last name is somewhere between, you know, Jones and, uh, let's see, Johnson and Jones, for example, um, the first name, again, once you get uh, beyond that, you're not going to be able to continue to use that index. It fails because you've, you've gotten too many. You, can't, you have to specify to continue to use that index. So as you're going across that index, you have to specify each value in order to continue to use, make use of that index. Um, so this is something that uh, I saw, so this is, I'm w working with this uh, uh, sample data. Um, this is something I actually saw at a company. Um, I don't think they were here in the last session, but they're not here anymore. It's a company I used to work for, and it wasn't the guys who were here. It was previous people who'd done this. Um, but that a latitude across, or uh, an index across latitude and longitude. Is that useful? <laughs> How often are you going to be able to use the right part of that index? Do you ever look up something on a specific latitude and longitude? Usually when you're looking up latitude and longitude, you're doing kind of a range. You want something in a box. You know, you want to, I want to find the nearest thing. Um, you're generally not looking for a, a specific point. Um, so that, that index was useless. Uh, not, not entirely useless, but the second part of the index was useless. It was never, ever going to use that second part of that index. So, like uh, he was saying, let's index everything, right? Is that our solution? Do we just index everything? And I've seen that done at a lot of places. Um, you just index it all. 
can you have too many indexes? Uh, first of all, let's look at some ways. That, you know, this uh, we've got an index on title, so we're looking at a, a, a table um, called film. So different films. Uh, this is another command that's useful in MySQL: show keys show keys from, it will show you all the, all the keys on a table. When you do a describe on a table, I've never figured out, it, it has a column for whether it's part of a key, and I've never figured out how it determines whether to put, you know, what it puts in that column, because sometimes things show up as being in a, you know, it just shows up blank even though they're part of a key, and other times it does show up as being part of a key. I've never really figured it out, but if you do show keys, it'll show you all the keys. So it's generally much more reliable to do this than to rely on what you see coming out of the describe statement. Um, so here, we've got a key. Uh, so you'll see the, the key name is IDX title, and the column is title. Now here we have another key. Now you'll see here, these two rows have the same key name. So that means it's a multi-column key. So this key is spanning across multiple columns, um, specifically the title and the release year. Because it makes sense, you know, some, sometimes you get a movie with the same name but a different year. It happens all the time, right? So you have to know the, the title and the year in order to really look up a specific one. Now, these two indexes, um, because we can use the leftmost prefix of an index, this index already takes care of what this index is for. So we don't need, so we're, we're just wasting space here. Right? We don't need that index. In, in addition to wasting space, every time you write to that table, it has to update every index. And so you're doing additional writes, um, additional calculations to, to uh, keep your index up to date. Um, to keep your, it's a B tree index, and so it's got to make sure that's all uh, properly balanced and stuff. And so having that extra index, it gets you no benefit and actually costs you on writes. So that's kind of where, when you're looking at, well, what do I, what index should I create? You have to think about um, an index will cost you every time you write to that table. It will help you potentially, when you read from that table. So you have to look at, is it worth it? You know, is that index worth having? You know, is the benefit from the, you know, any performance you would get with reads uh, going to outweigh the, um, you know, the extra overhead of having to update that index every time you update the table? Um, a virtualized Joseph, sorry. Um, so this is WordPress, the WP posts table. Uh, this is uh, the default indexes on that table. You've got an index, it's called type status date. It's across post type, status, date, and ID. Now the date is misnamed, it's actually a date time. Um, so it's got the full, you know, down to the second. Now, how often do you think, if you specify a type, status, and the exact second that that post happened, how often are you going to return more than one post? <coughs> even, even just the time would tell you, you know, just that one post, right? But they've got, you know, they've got it in this because sometimes you're looking up you know, you want posts of a certain type. Um, you, you know, you want posts that are published and ordered by date, right? Well, what's that ID doing there? I have no idea. Joseph is submitting a bug fix to uh, WordPress right now. <laughs> what's that? I'm sure it filters the spam nicely. Would it ever be possible to post two things at the exact same time? It's possible. It's just the benefit you get from having that extra column. I mean, you can still look up. This isn't a unique index. You see a non-unique one. 
that means it's not a unique index. It's just useful for helping us. It's not trying to, you know, it, it's not guaranteeing any uniqueness. So even if on the off chance that you had two posts at the exact same time, it's, it's not that big a deal. It, it'll return both of them and, you know, it'll, you're still, even if you specify the ID on there. And, and the other thing is, if you specify the ID to make that useful, um, it's going to use the primary key, which is on ID. So. It, Oh, just drop the ID from that index. Yeah, you're just you're just adding overhead, um, adding overhead and storage from having that that additional column. Um, what's the difference between the besides like only having one primary key? Is there a difference between um, uh, the primary key and the regular index of your bank? Well, the primary key is always unique. So you see in the and this is one thing I find unusual. Why why doesn't it say unique instead of non-unique? So you've got to reverse your thinking when you're, you're looking at show keys. Um, so non-unique is zero, which means it is unique. Got our double negative there. Um, so the primary key is always unique. Um, you can do auto increments on it and stuff like that. Um, in InnoDB, uh, the primary key, like your secondary keys, assuming this is an InnoDB table, um, this uh, key the result of looking up this key will actually be the primary key, so the ID, and then it'll look that up in the primary key to find the row. And so secondary keys, you actually do a, a two-level lookup. You have to look up in the secondary key to get the primary key, and then you look up in the primary key when you're using an ODB. Um, so, so you actually, uh, so that's kind of, does that kind of answer your question? So the primary key is its own, it's the main thing on the table. Um, if you're using InnoDB and you don't specify a primary key, it will create one for you and just not tell you about it. It hides it from you. So, so if, with InnoDB, it does have a primary key. With MyISOM, it won't. Um, hopefully, you're not using MyISOM. Right. You could. You can do multi-column primary keys. Um, there are. Yeah. Well, with InnoDB, if that was generally how you're doing your lookups, like I said, with the secondary keys, you have to do two lookups. You have to look up the secondary key and then look up the primary key. Um, if your primary key is what you're always going to be looking up anyway, um, that'll save you that extra lookup. So it can be useful. It depends. Um, there are some, you know, if, if you're doing auto increments, um, then it, one thing to know with, with multi-column primary keys, uh, if you try to do an auto increment on the last column on InnoDB, it won't work. It will work in my ISOM, but it doesn't work in InnoDB. So just a little something. Um, so... Now here's, here's our explain. So we're getting down, you know, we, we specify a post date and the ID. And so we're actually going to get there. But like I said, you've got to specify the post date out to the second in order for the ID field to be useful. But at that point, we've only got one row anyway. Yes? What about relative? So what if we said post date less than? Once you introduce a range, the rest of the key is useless. So once, once you're using a range, um, so if you use a range on post state, then it can't use the ID. Are, are your keys ever clustered? Hmm? Are your keys ever clustered? So with find that, it knows the top or bottom half is greater or less than? Um, it can. If they, uh, Looked it up. Domus was one of the ones who was involved in that particular. Okay. I'm gonna blame it on. Okay. Um, I, as far as I know, there's. That's where, when I looked up, that's where it's commonly being used. That particular index. Yeah. In WordPress, where it's picking that up is when it's 
doing all those qualifiers and looking for posts to happen before or after an exact date. Right. But once you get a range, and, and the thing is, it's not the primary key, and so it's, you know, it's just pointing to stuff in the primary key. Um, it can, if you're looking for specific IDs, um, I guess there's some benefit because, like, if you say where it's between these and the ID is greater than something, um, you have a possible benefit where it could perform that lookup in the key instead of having to get the row from the table in order to find out. Um, so, but if you're giving a, an order, you know, if you're specifying a range of dates, you're probably not specifying a range of ID. Does that make sense? I mean, it's probably, if you knew, I mean, the IDs are going to be tightly tied to dates as well. So if you knew the IDs you wanted, you'd probably they, they are, just do that. So. Right. Yeah. So I, I guess it would give you. But you can also it'll still give you that anyway. You don't need an index on it in order to to have you know MySQL figure out which one to give you first. You can still use that in your order by, and it'll give you the right one in the right order. It won't cause that much overhead if you have two that happen at the same second. And I, the, the point is that we can talk about theoretical benefits to that ID being in that index. But in reality, the chances of that ever happening are very slim. And when they do happen, it's not really going to cause enough overhead to, to uh, justify having that in there. Does that make sense? So let's talk about how joins work. Joins are Cartesian by default. Does anyone not know what Cartesian means? Cartesian is when you take two things, two, uh, like think of two arrays, and you're going to take everything in this side and join it up against everything on the other side. So, the, so if you have 10 on this side and 10 on this side, you're going to end up with 100 in your result set. Does that make sense? So everything is going to match up against every possible thing on the other side. All right? Now this next example is something I actually saw. Someone, someone came to me and asked why this query wasn't working. Or why my keyboard's not working again. Okay. So, <laughs> now what he was trying to do was get all of the information out of all of the tables at the same time. I mean, he, was, he thought he was being clever. Um, it, it never came back, and the server eventually crashed because it ran out of memory. <laughs> um, these tables had tens of thousands of rows each. <laughs> Um, yeah, that didn't work very well. Probably, actually, tens of thousands is probably on the. Well, they, it was a dev. He, he fortunately never did this in production. Um, so yeah, it was only tens of thousands. Uh, I mean, this is at Omniture, so they. I mean, they're getting millions of stuff daily or minute by the minute. They're getting millions of stuff getting in. So, so fortunately, it was our dev site. Didn't have too much data, just tens of thousands of rows per per table. But you know, you know. 10,000 to the 20th is a very large number. <coughs> so um, I prefer not to use the comma syntax. I prefer to use the join syntax, um, the join keyword, I mean. Uh, it just lets you see what's going on a little better. Um, when, you, when you use a join, you can s specify uh, using or on, and that will let you uh, tell it exactly how that join's happening. Um, when I first started, uh, you know, 15 years ago, didn't know any better. Kind of the the way everyone was doing things with MySQL was to do the joins with a comma, and then they specified the condition in the where clause. Now, 
MySQL will work just fine with that. It'll figure out, oh, that's a you know, join condition and take care of it for you. Um, it just makes it harder for you to realize if you forgot to specify a join condition. Because um, if you what this that, oh specifying a a join um no we're just we're just talking about joins yeah subqueries are whole another can of worms um, if you're using MySQL uh, before. Does five Colin does five six of MySQL fix the subqueries like you guys did? No, okay. So if you have MariaDB, then then you're you're welcome to try out subqueries. Um, if you're not using MariaDB, probably not right now because um, uh, they don't optimize very well. Anyway, so join conditions. You want to use your on clause. I generally use on instead of using. Um, it's no real difference. I just like to be able to specify the exact things with that. So uh, for example, here we're selecting field one, field two from table one, join table two using field three. And that means that it's gonna look for that field name in both tables and join them together. Um, here, we're using the on clause where we say this field in this table matches this field in that table. So, and you can specify more than one thing. You can say where this is that and something else. Um, so you can do lots of, lots of different things in those uh, join clauses. Uh, but doing that um, lets you easily see what's going on here. You can see when I'm joining, I'm going to be joining this to this. And you wanna have that, that's important for reasons we'll talk about. Um, all right, so each row, when you, when you do that join, it'll do the first table first, generally. And the optimizer, if you write your query wrong, the optimizer in MySQL will fix it for you. And so it'll sometimes change the table order on you. Uh, you, can, you can override that behavior if, if you know better than the optimizer, but generally, the optimizer um, will take your table order. And so it'll say, okay, well, we've got table one and table two, so it'll look up whatever you got in table two, and then for each row, it'll do this condition to look up corresponding rows in table two. So that's what a join is. Now, using this syntax, by using the on clause, um, you can see we've got this complex join you know, big hole, you know, we've got five different tables going on, but we can easily see how those are being joined. We can see, you know, when we bring film actor in, we're looking at the film ID, we're making sure it's the same. And then when we bring actor in, we're matching the actor ID to the actor ID from the film actor table. So it's very, you know, when I'm doing bigger joins like this, I always write them out like this you know, using a little indentation and stuff to just, just to help me see and understand what's going on. And it keeps me from making mistakes. Um, you know, like, because if you forget this on clause, you're back to Cartesian. You're doing a Cartesian join again, which, um, remember uh, Brian Aker from the Drizzle project saying once that, you know, they actually removed, Car they made, it's impossible to do a Cartesian join by default in Drizzle because whoever does one on purpose. I mean, it's very unlikely that you do a Cartesian join on purpose. We've all done them by accident, but we usually don't do them on purpose. So full table scans. Um, got this query here. We're looking at the film list and we're joining the category on the name. Now when we explain that, you're gonna see that um, it's actually, uh, like I just mentioned, you see the first table it looks at is C, which is what we aliased category. And then the second table is F, which is film list. That's actually backwards from what I told it to do. Why did it do that? Well. 
if you look here um, on the category, it figured out, well, there's only 16 rows in category. So we can look them all up in one go and, and just kind of have that information. And then we'll look through the, the film list table and do our matching there. Um, that'll be a lot more efficient. But we're doing a lot of looking up. Um, you see, using where, anytime you're using where, um, you're not using an index. You know, nowhere, we don't have any indexes specified. And so it's not using an index for this join. It's going to look up 16, in the worst case anyway, it'll look up 16 times 970 through uh, possible uh, result sets before giving you what you asked for. Um, we're actually just looking for ones with the price of 499, but that wasn't indexed, and so it couldn't do anything with that. So this where, in this example, which is a little contrived, I, I, I was using this test data to come up with a query that wouldn't use an index on a join. Um, and I actually had to, to be fair to the test data, I had to uh, um, make some alterations to the tables to make this work right. <laughs> so uh, the, the film list table isn't actually a real table in the in the test data, it's a view, and so it actually indexed correctly. Um, so I selected out of it, made a real table called film list instead of making it a view. Um, and then, you know, so it's a little bit contrived. But in this case, the where clause is that the price is 499. Since that's not indexed, it's got to look up everything. It's got to look through the whole table. So. Right. And it wouldn't have said using where in the show table. Yeah, I would have had the, the index, using index. Now it did, I should say, you saw some additional information there using join buffer. Um, so that's telling you, you know, basically 16 rows that figures, oh, I can fit those in memory while I'm looking up all the other stuff. So I don't have to, you know, it can do it a lot more efficiently. Um, than 16 by 973. So it's, it's not really going to do quite as many things. It's going to be able to make some optimizations. Um, if it just said using where, that's when you're, you're really doing, you know, you're multiplying those together uh, to get what it's doing. Right. Um, yeah, for the second table. Because the first, the first table um, on the on clause, uh, so the, if you're going in the order of film list and then category, uh, what you're matching from film list doesn't need to be indexed um, because it's going to get it anyway. It's just, it's looking up. You know, hopefully you have this indexed, and so it's getting the rows it needs, and then it's taking whatever's there and then using the index on this. So to make this query optimal, we'd have to add an index on price and the category name. And then it would uh, be very quick. Now, one of the things that it was able to use the join buffer is because the data set is so small. If, you have, if your production data set is this small, um, you probably don't need to attend this talk because everything will go fast. <laughs> no matter how much you screw up your queries, it'll probably go really fast. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, for, for most of us, we have a little bit more data than that, and so this stuff matters. Okay, don't put a query inside a loop. Um, now, you laugh, you know, it's, of course you don't put a query inside a loop, um, but then you're using an ORM and you do something that the ORM puts, you know, you're doing something with the ORM and don't realize that you've effectively put a query inside a loop. Um, so here we're looking through all the film IDs. You know, we got those from some result set, and then for each one, we're looking up select star, right? This is dumb, right? For each one we get, we have to do a separate query. There's a lot of overhead to doing a query. You know, it's got to parse the SQL. It's got to look stuff up. Um, it's a lot better 
to, to get all the data in one query and then loop through the results. Um, now if you use a, a good join, you can eliminate the need for additional queries. Um, like I said, if you're using an ORM, uh, you could be doing something like this, like you get a bunch of film IDs and then you loop through them and just say, okay, load that film. Well, you're telling it one at a time to go do a select star on that, for that film to load everything. And with a lot of ORMs, if you've got foreign keys and stuff, it's actually loading from more than one table. Um, you're actually really bogging down your database by doing this. And so it's not, it's not as, uh, you know, it, this code is obviously bad, but it happens more often than you think um, when you're dealing with ORMs, uh, simply because they abstract that away from you. You're not thinking about what it's doing under the covers. You need to, um, you need to think about that. What's gonna be the effect? So our ORMs generally are gonna have bulk loading methods um, and you can even specify joins with most ORMs, uh, most modern ones anyway. If you're using one from a few years ago, that was a little harder, but these days, they generally have these functions, you just have to make use of them. So you have to understand how your ORM works. Um, I don't personally use an ORM, but I'm like a database geek, so I like to write my own queries and make them do the thing I want them to do. So I'm not your general use case. Um, I understand that most people do use an ORM, but you're all using different ORMs probably, and so uh, you, know, you need to be familiar with your ORM and how to get around these kinds of problems with your ORM. How to tell it, tell the database what to do. Um, so in this case, uh, we're gonna rewrite this query. We're gonna select star from film where film ID is in this list of film IDs. Now if you attended my PHP security talk, you know that um, this is really bad. Um, we're assuming that we've already sanitized our film IDs to make sure they're all integers. Um, but uh, then we're gonna you know, loop, through each, loop through the results set and echo out our list. So other kinds of indexes. Um, you wanna know about other kinds? The default index on most tables that you're gonna have in MySQL is a B-tree index. It's a I mean, the technology for B-tree indexes is pretty old. It's been around, well-proven technology, um, and it just kind of balances things out. Um, and it lets you, you know, some things we take for granted, B-tree indexes let you look on ranges. So you don't have to just specify a single thing. You can look for a range. Now, hash indexes um, are a little different. A hash index, you can only look up a single row. For example, if you've got memcache running, who uses memcache? Probably a fair number. Um, memcache, you, you can't say I want everything between here and here, right? You've got to tell it exactly what you want because it's using a hash index. The memory storage engine in MySQL uses a hash index. Um, and I think that's the only one I'm aware of that uses a hash index. Uh, full text indexes. In uh, my ISOM, you can do a full text index. Uh, it's really, uh, honestly, if you, I mean, I'd only use this if you don't really need your full text index that much. You know, it's not a major thing. If you're really relying on full text indexes, I'd look other places, um, Sphinx, Lucene, Solar, there are all sorts of things. I use Sphinx for mine. It integrates well with uh, MySQL. Uh, MariaDB has a Sphinx storage engine built in, uh, which is what I use, which lets you connect to your Sphinx server um, within your SQL. So it, it makes it easy to, to get stuff out and you know, just manipulate a lot, lot better. Uh, but you can use full ten text indexes in my ISM. Um, MySQL 5.6 has them in InnoDB. And I just updated my slide 20 minutes ago because Colin told me that MariaDB 1003 
will have full text indexes in, in ODB as well. A spatial index. So spatial index is a special kind of index for geospatial tables. Uh, geospatial indexes are only valid in my ISM. Um, is that still correct in 10? In MariaDB 10? For the geospatial indexes? Okay. Awesome. So the geospatial, you can use geospatial data types in, in, uh, in ODB right now, but you can't use the indexes for them. So the, you kind of think of a, you know, a geospatial, like the latitude longitude problem I was talking about earlier. A geospatial index would actually solve that for you because you can get, um, get that down to that rectangle very quickly. This is bad. So I'm a little confused. You said the B tree index can use ranges, and the B tree index is the default? Yes. But index is because we can't use ranges? No, the index can't use the range past. It, if you have a multi column index, it can't continue to use the index after the range. Okay. Does that make sense? So a single column index. Yeah. Yeah, single column index, no problem. Multi column, it's fine. You just have to understand that once you use it, once you introduce a range into your conditions, um, you're not going to be able to continue to use that index. Uh, the the rest of that index is useless. Um, so then there's the kind of index I call the BYO index. Uh, long time ago, uh, it, was, it was on the MySQL mailing list. Uh, uh, someone posted some complaint about how MySQL limited your keys to 124 characters. And I said, good heavens, what are you doing? Why, why would you have an index that long? Um, and he said, well, I work for Yahoo, and we have URLs, and the URLs are sometimes longer than that. I said, oh, well, that makes sense. But then I asked, do you ever look for a range of URLs, or are you just looking up a single URL? And he said, well, we just look up, you know, we're looking up a, an exact URL. And so I said, well, just hash it. Um, and, uh, and he did. And uh, yeah. Is there a caching algorithm out there besides KD5 that can generate something less than a 32 character extra You can use, I mean, there, MySQL has built in a CRC32. It's not technically quite a hash. Um, it has some properties of a hash, uh, but not, you know, it's not a, a well distributed hash like MD5. Um, you know, it's more, it's, it's made for error correction more than hashing. Um, but that's, that's what you've got built into MySQL. You can, I actually at a previous company, we compiled a user-defined function in order to get a 32-bit um, hash function that, that we um, had, you know, we found a, a hash function that worked well for 32 bits and was fast, and we did that. We were doing this with URLs, um, and so we were able to use that function. Uh, I, I have no idea what, where we, I, you know, this was almost 15 years ago. I have no idea where we got this function um, I remember that we researched it a lot and it worked really well, uh, but, but we used that in order to get an integer so that our, our indexes would be small. The 32-bit one that's built in is uh, CRC32. A CRC32 returns a 32-bit integer. So it's it's four bytes. So it's it's very it, it can be very useful. Um, so hash a column for really long keys. If you don't need the range aspects of it, just hash it and include that. And then when you do a lookup, um, like for example, in this case, we use a 32-bit key, and then we would also specify the URL in our query. 
And so even if it returned more than, you know, if that key, if there was a collision on that key, we didn't make it unique so that, you know, if there was more than one um, that matched that, we would just, you know, it would use the URL to figure out which one. Yeah, you can do that too. Yep. Depending on what, 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 what you said, because, because I do that to the grid and see, it depends on what is being generated. If, so, if a probability is something that needs to be generated all the time, right? Yeah, so it depends on your data set. What you get does. Yeah. With like Git, you know, that you just need to keep the last, you know, you don't need to be able Yeah, I mean, uh, what what we found with our 32-bit hash, we were getting you know millions of rows in this table, and you know we looked and didn't have any collisions, and so we, you know, we called it good. It was going to generally be be sufficient for us. Yeah, and you right right. And you can, now if you use MD5, uh, generally, like if you're doing it in PHP or, or MySQL, it's going to return a, a base 16, you know, a, a hex. Yeah, a hex, 32. You know, it's not going to be, so it's going to be double the size yeah. that it would be uh, packed. And so, you know, you'll either want to have a function that takes care of that for you. You know, basically it's, you know, there's, there's a trade-off of convenience and, um, and stuff for it. So if there, are you know, you can write a, you know, either user defined function, you can do a, you know, a stored procedure that takes care of that for you. Um, you know, something in your code that takes care of that for you. Just, just something that makes it convenient for you. You, you, you know, because if it's too much of a pain to use, then you're going to have, you know, that's going to cause other problems as well. So you want something that's going to be usable for you. Yep. Yeah. Understood. So is this uh, when you're creating the hash of the index? Is this top, like creating a whole new column that is parallel with yeah. the hash? Yeah. Yeah. You'd create a whole new column. So. All right. Well, we're going to. Um, so we're going to take. Uh, this was scheduled for um, two hours, but we'll, if you guys want to take a five minute break, and we'll, we'll continue on um, in a little bit, so. All right. So I think we're, Waiting on, I see a, a hat and a, assume that guy's coming back for his uh, laptop there. So. <laughs> yeah. have a multi column index, we optimize to try and rearrange it so that it's too. Yeah, the order you specify stuff. What order, what order you specify your where clause? Doesn't matter to the optimize. It'll figure out whether it's just going to look at is the first part of the index specified. It doesn't matter when you specify it, as long as it's specified, it'll use it. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Well, sometimes, sometimes you can't index it. Um, in that case, uh, the best thing to do is cache it. Uh, say you got some really big report that runs every night, you know? Well, something that runs once a day might not be worth indexing for. You know, the right overhead from doing that, or maybe it's just impossible to index for. Maybe the kind of query you're running just isn't indexable. Um, in that case, uh, do it less often. Don't have it run every time the marketing guys hit refresh on their browser. Um, you know, because you got 10 of them, they all come to the report five times a day, but they really, Generally, I've found the marketing guys are always looking at yesterday's data. They, they hardly ever care about today's data. They're looking at yesterday's and before that. 
Um, so running it once a day, putting it into, you know, have a cache table that you put your data into is perfectly fine in those kind of cases. Um, sometimes uh, I've had cases where, you know, we're doing reads on a table, you know, we're doing a select that just is really hard to, to optimize. It's just really hard. You know, and, and what we're looking at is trying to reduce the number of rows that the database server has to look at. How many rows is it going to have to look at on the disk? Um, so what we've done is instead of doing that with an index, we limited it by creating a read-only cache for searching. Uh, and we only put the information in there that was valid for searching. For example, um, you know, I, I worked at a site, uh, at a company that did uh, you know, dating websites. Um, if someone hadn't logged into the site for a year, we didn't want to show them in our search results. And so we didn't include them in that cache. We only included the people who were, you know, for example, had logged in in the last 30 days. I'm not sure exactly what that number was, but our cache would only include those people um, and that way we were eliminating, you know, we wanted to keep their information in the database, but when we were searching, we didn't need to search them. If you haven't logged in for a while, you know, we still love you, but you're not going to show up. And so we're not going to include you in that cache. Um, so we're, we're accomplishing that, you know, filtering, limiting our filtering uh, through the use of just making the table smaller that we're going to be doing that searching on. So we would refresh that cache table every so often. Um, and uh, yeah, we'd rotate the table. So we'd create a new table and then uh, slip the, the new one into place and rotate, rotate out the old one. Um, and then, you know, that was how we accomplished that. And, and so that table is also in MySQL, that's not like a... Uh, yeah, this is all in MySQL. Like solar... Nope. No, and we actually did it with, uh, in this case, uh, it depends on, I've done this a couple of different companies, but... Um, uh, the last time we did this, uh, we actually did it with, uh, specifically with my ISOM tables in order to take advantage of the geospatial indexes. So we had, you know, the, the real user information was stored in InnoDB, so it, you know, we could take advantage of all the, the advantages you get from InnoDB. Um, but then for the, the searching, we would do that on my ISOM. It was okay to us if that table crashed and burned because it wasn't the real copy of the data, it was just a cache. Uh, you know, it regenerated every five or 10 minutes anyway. What do we care if it crashes? Uh, <laughs> you know, we're just gonna start back over again. Um, so it wasn't a big deal to us. Um, depending, you know, but, but it, it really depends on your data set and what you're doing. So how, how you solve that problem. I'm just trying to give some ideas that you can come back and apply to your problems. Yeah, it sounds like there'd be a lot better Not, ideas using external caching, but... Yeah, there are, times, there are times that external stuff makes sense. Depending on your kind of caching, um, that makes sense. You know, and I'll talk about that a little later, you know, use memcache or something. You know, that's, you know, sometimes you can cache a whole page. You know, if you're the Deseret News, you know, when people come to the front page of the Deseret News, it always looks the same. You know, if I come and you come, it's going to look the same for both of us. So why does it have to go to the database, you know, make all these queries to get all the information to create that table every, or create that page every time? It doesn't. And so they're able to optimize it. I assume they're using some kind of cache layer so that when you come, it just, you know, it's going to show whatever it's got cached. Um, you know, it's caching either parts of the, you know, segments of the page or the whole page or whatever, and it's able to display that very quickly for you. Um, sharded cache tables. Um, Mark talked about how Facebook uses sharded tables. Um, so sometimes sharding can be helpful. Again, you're limiting uh, the, the amount of rows. Um, we, we actually, uh, this isn't something I've done um, as much, but you know, for example, um, again, if you're using, if you're, if you're on a site where location is an important part of how you're doing searching uh, for your site, 
then maybe having you know, location-based tables makes sense. So if you're in this table, you live in this area. And then if you're doing a search, you can say, well, you know, I need to look up, um, you know, maybe if you're near the boundary, you have to look up in two different tables to find out um, all the information you need. Uh, but you're dealing with a lot smaller data sets when you're doing your lookups, and so it's a lot easier for that uh, database to, to do that lookup. And so you're, even though occasionally you're going to have to do more than one lookup, you're still overall saving a lot of database time by doing that. This is really bugging me. All right, redundancy. We can talk a little bit about redundancy. Um, redundant queries. Have you ever looked at what your application actually does? What queries it's actually doing? It's fun. You have to find out all the things it's doing 10 times. Um, <laughs> you know, I've looked at applications where you know, you're loading a page and it's looking up the same thing over and over and over again because it's calling some function and that function, the first thing it does is look up something else. And even though it already got that before, during that same page request, it's doing that same lookup again. Um, so make sure that it's only doing it once. At, at the very least, you want to cache within a single page load. You want to make sure that you're only doing the same query once. Yeah? How would, you, how would I go about checking that? In your application, there, you know, it, it depends on your application. A lot of, uh, for example, um, a lot of frameworks uh, have functionality that lets you um, have a debug log um, that that'll show all the query. You can you can enable that kind of thing. There's also ways to do it from the other side that we'll talk about in a little bit. But huh? Yeah, with MySQL you can set slow query to zero, and then it'll log every query that happens. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it's doing it over. I mean, it's basically you have the problem of it doing a query in a loop. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So having that, that's a that's a perfect example. Doing a permissions lookup. You know, anytime something's happening, you, you know, your application has good security. It's trying to keep people from doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing. Um, but, but the end result is, you know, the, the odds that the permissions have changed between when your page started loading and when it ends loading are probably pretty slim. Um, so you can just make that check at the beginning and just assume that your permissions are the same at the end. Um, so if you got a session, store, store information in their session. Uh, Anything you store in the session, now there, you know, don't store everything in the session, but you know, some things don't belong in a session. But you know, any kind of relevant user information that you're going to be needing, you know, if you need their first name on every page load, don't make it have to go to the database every page load. Just store it in their session, and you've already got it. Uh, use memcached. Um, that's you know, there are other things out there. Uh, besides memcached, you know Redis and whatever, you know there's there's uh, tons of those kind of uh, data stores, um, but those will let you uh, do very quick lookups, um, cache stuff there, and then pull that information out when you need it. Uh, you can, I mean, you have to be careful with your caching so that you don't end up using, you know, if if it's important that you know something, you know, what the state of this is right now. You know, five minutes ago isn't good enough for you. You need to know right now. Then you shouldn't be throwing it in memcache, probably. You know, in this 
you know, the last example with permissions, you know, within a single page load, yeah, you can probably keep that, but maybe not in between page loads. Maybe you don't want to cache permissions because, you know, when they, when you change someone's permissions, you want those that to take effect the next time they load a page. Um, so, you know, then you have to deal with, you know, you can't put that in memcache, but then you'd have to make sure you invalidate it when they're, when the data changes. Um, so you can do that and still cache it, but it adds a little overhead in the logic in your code to make sure that that happens so that you don't end up with a situation where things are out of date. Sometimes out of date is fine, and that's a perfect use case for caching it. Um, a lot of ORMs have ways to, you know, some of our ORMs already, you know, they have integration with memcache where you don't even really need to do anything besides turn it on and it'll take care of uh, caching stuff for you. So that can be very useful. So um, who uses MyISM? Anybody? You got some MyISM going on? It's okay, I've got a few MyISM tables still hanging around. Um, so I'm gonna talk real quick about the MyISM table lock problem. Uh, this is basically the, the, the big problem with uh, MyISM and the, you know, why it doesn't scale well. Uh, let's say you've got, you know, you've got a select going on that takes 0.1 seconds and you got one that took three and a half seconds. And then you got someone, you know, someone in marketing ran some report and it's taken two minutes to run this report. In the meantime, someone updates their profile. Now that query takes 0.0, .0 seconds. It's lightning fast. But it has to wait for this guy to finish because he can't update the table while someone else is reading it. You can have multiple people reading the table, but once someone wants to write to it, he's got to have the table to himself while he's writing to it. Now you get some really fast select queries coming in after that. These guys are waiting for this guy to finish because they can't select from the table until the update's done. And uh, this guy's waiting for this one. So even though your update is very fast, the, the weak link here is this select that's taking two minutes. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the ones below it, the other select statements could read concurrently if that update wasn't there? Yeah, if that update wasn't there, they could all go at the same time. And it doesn't know that this one is going to be, you know, that fast. It doesn't know that, oh, well, we could slip that in while we're waiting. You know, it doesn't know how long that query is going to take. And so it just has to wait its, its turn until that update finishes. It's going to just stick around. With uh, multi-version concurrency control, which is what we use, you know, with InnoDB, um, you know, that's what... Postgres uses it, you know, by, it only has one storage engine, so that's what it uses. Um, but multi-version concurrency control is, is basically what pretty much every, uh, you know, enterprise database is going to be using. Uh, when you do a select um, or any kind of query, what it's doing, it's looking at how that table looked. You know, here what we're doing is this update is setting row five to H instead of E. That's all, we, you know, so that's, that's what's happening. Um, but this query is going to only look at this version of the table. So that can, query two can happen while this one's running and this one will still return E. So query one is gonna return E even though the data changed while it was looking at it. There are always two tables? Oh, there can be more than it, it's not, it's done, it's a lot more complicated. It's not just a, it's not a, I mean, it's done more granular than that. It's not at the table level. Um, but you're looking at, what you're looking at will be how the table looks when you started your query. But it's done more efficiently. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the way multi-version concurrency control is implemented is very complex, and we're not going to get into that. Um, <laughs> But you know the, the end result is that query one will get E out of that table. 
Um, with the small caveat that depending on your server's isolation level setting and whether you're doing multiple select, you know, multiple queries in a single transaction, you could end up with a situation where it did get H. Um, if, if, if the quir first query was actually multiple queries happening, and depending on your isolation level, it, you could get a situation where it would get the, the one that was updated even if the transaction started before um, the, the second one. So, but if you're just, if you're not using big trans, it's, it's, it's not a common occurrence. And it depends, it does depend on your isolation level that you set. So you can do that either way. No, you should never get, um, if you do it twice, you should always get the same thing. It's just that, that with the isolation level setting, what it'll do is, is it going to look at, the, the idea is, is it going to look at that table at the time the query started or the transaction started? Um, so if you have multiple queries in a single transaction, and once you look at a single, at a table with that transaction, that table is locked to that time that that query started. Uh, like I said, it, I mean, it's, it's easier on the database if it doesn't have to worry about everybody every time you start a transaction. And so it goes a little faster if you, if you say, yeah, I'll, I'll accept that little trade-off that it might not, you know, but, but generally your transactions are happening so quickly that you don't really care. You know, so that's, I think the default is that it's, it's gonna accept a little bit of, you know, uh, you know, the possibility of it being a little bit off um, in exchange for being a lot more performant. All right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's more it's more complex than I mean there is row level locking, but it is more complex because you can still get it's only a locking while it's doing it and you can still get that information. Yeah. Yep. So batching writes. Um, sometimes, you know, your database might be collecting some statistics. You know, when did someone log in? You know, you want to keep track of their logins. You know, maybe that information is, you know, good. You know, it's good to know, but if it doesn't get written to the database, you know, for a minute, then it's, you know, it's not the end of the world. You know, if something crashed and that never got written to the database that they logged in at 1.31 today, you know, no one's really gonna care that much. Um, you know, sometimes you have information like that where it's, it's kind of good to know information, but, but not critical. You know, if you're dealing with uh, billing transactions, you know, you're, you know, that kind of information, obviously when, when you bill someone, you know, when you charge your credit card, you gotta make sure that gets in the database. You know, you don't mess around with that. But, you know, if, if it's information that's good to know, but that, you know, if you lost one of their logins you know, out of all the times they've logged into your site, it wouldn't be the end of the world. Um, you can look into doing stuff like uh, batching your writes. Put all your data into a queue and then insert it all at one time. Um, so you have a, a process that reads that queue, does a bulk insert or update, and puts that data into your database. Um, if you're interested, Redis has a built-in queue type, uh, a list data type that you can just, so you can quickly, atomically just put stuff into a list and then you can get the stuff out of that very quickly. Yeah? Uh, does, oh. does that happen Yes. MySQL, no, you can, uh, well, you have to, you can batch writes in MySQL. You can insert lots of stuff at once with MySQL. But there's, you can't say, 
wait the, you know, you can't tell it to let this query just wait till later when it can group it together, no. There is an insert delay option, but it's not really all that fantastic. Yeah, it's, to do updates with yeah, it's, if you have that problem, handler socket may solve it for you. A handler socket uh, was written, uh, I think Mark mentioned it in his keynote, um, but it was written by a company called DNA. It's a Japanese online gaming company. Um, and they're dealing with millions of updates all, you know, constantly. You know, anytime anyone does something in their game, it's, it's updating some table somewhere. So they had to be able to deal with those millions of updates that were happening constantly. So what handler socket is, is, this is what I get for using PowerPoint. You can say that my brother used to work for Microsoft, but he quit last month, so. And now it's just going to crap. <laughs> I know, look what happens when he left. Um, I, he actually worked on the SQL Server team, so. Had nothing to do with PowerPoint. Uh, handler socket is a non-SQL interface to your InnoDB tables. So think of it like memcache for InnoDB, except a little more powerful than memcache because you can do, uh, you can deal with more, you know, memcache is just key value. Uh, you can get a little more granular than that with, with handler socket. So you can, you know, specify multiple columns that you're inserting and, you know, select. But, you know, it's, you're only dealing on keys, and so you can only get one thing at a time. Um, you can only insert or update or delete or select one thing at a time. Um, but what it will do in the background, it assumes that if you're using handler socket, your data is important to you, but not important enough to make sure it gets in immediately. So what it does is it starts a transaction and takes all the stuff, and then every so often it commits a transaction and starts a new one. And so by doing that, uh, InnoDB is only going to, you know, it's going to put all those writes on it at the same time. Um, so you're able to, so that kind of gets you the situation where you can just put them in as soon as they come in, put them right into the database um, using the handler socket interface and it'll take care of that for you. Um, the nice thing about that is that you can have a NoSQL interface, a very fast NoSQL interface to your database and still when you want to select stuff out of it, you're still dealing with MySQL and you can you know, run reports on that data. It's a great, great way to do things. Yes? Um, is there a way to check like, how busy your MySQL is so you can just uh, do a answer and see if my idle is busy? Um, not, there's not like a, I mean, there are ways to check, but not, not that you're, I mean, you kind of have to, I mean, you can look at your process list, you can look at, there are ways you can check, but, you know, there's, there's a little overhead there. So, I mean, you could, uh, you could potentially write something like that by looking at the process list. Would probably be the easiest thing, um, but it doesn't tell you everything, so. Is there, is there something that, so I guess, you can just look at the process list and see how many things Yeah. A good metric if you have replication is if your replication is behind. If you have a replication backlog, that, that'll tell you that you know, your database isn't keeping up well right now. So that, that's, that's kind of a good metric to, to let you know when things are slowing down. So, um, so handler socket is available in MariaDB and Percona server. Um, it can be compiled for Oracle's MySQL as well, but it doesn't come by default. If you get MariaDB or Percona in the last quite a while, it's going to come with that. Just built in, ready. You got to compile a couple things for it, but I will warn you, there is, well, okay. I say no authentication. There is, you can put a password in plain text in your my.cnf file and it will kind of do authenticate, but that just gives it, you're basically giving it root access to your database. So be careful. Um, I filed a bug a long time ago, and it's generally been ignored. 
So I, I, it'd be nice to have some kind of, uh, you know, either authentication or being able to limit. Um, what I'd like is to have it just say, well, I don't care about authentication, but I only want handler socket to be able to deal with these tables. So if I could just specify tables that handler socket's allowed to deal with, that'd be perfect for me. Um, MySQL 5.6 includes a memcached plugin for InnoDB. So you can use the memcached protocol, which is well supported in pretty much every language. Um, so it's very easy to use. Handler socket, you know, there's, you know, you've kind of got to do things a little your own. You know, there's stuff out there, but you got to do a little more um, to, to get that to work. Uh, memcached plugin that comes with Oracle's MySQL 5.6. Uh, does that, it has similar uh, benchmark results. Um, I haven't seen exact comparisons, but it's going to get a, you know, similar performance increases as you're going to see with Handler Socket. So replication. I don't know how many of you remember uh, Calvin Hobbes. It's one of my favorite series the, when he made the, the duplicator. He, uh, he wanted to get out of doing chores. Um, so he thought, well, I'll clone myself and make all my clones do chores. And then I won't have to do chores. Unfortunately, his clones were just as lazy as him. And so no chores got done. So replication. Um, replication gets, you know, you, you hear it, you know, it, it's kind of like indexes. Um, everyone knows that when you, you know, when your query is running slow, add an index. Everyone know when your database is, Running slow? Well, let's just replicate it. That'll solve all our problems, right? Um, no, it doesn't. It solves some problems, um, but it can cause problems too. So you need to understand how replication works, what the potential problems are, and how it's going to affect your code. Because it's not, I can't tell you whether replication will work for you up here. You know, I don't know enough about your code base and how your data works to be able to tell you whether replication is a good thing for you. Um, and it's possible that it can increase the impact of your rights um, by, you know, depending on how you have things architected, it can actually cause things to get worse. Um, as an example of making things worse, uh, let's, let's say for example that you're, uh, um, you've got a master, you've got a slave, uh, you do all your writes on the master, you do all your reads on the slave. Your user comes to your site, they want to update their profile, they go in and they change something. Now, let's say they got married, they changed their last name. They hit update and it reloads the page with their updated information, except it got that information with the slave and the slave didn't have the update yet. So now they're going to say, ah, I just did that. Why didn't your site work? So now you have an angry customer because they have to do it twice. And depending on your slave lag, they might be doing it five or 10 times before it finally seems like it worked, right? You know, if, you're, if your slave is almost into instantaneously update, up to date, then, you know, they may only have to do it twice. But, but they may have to do it five, 10 times. Maybe, they're, maybe they give up after 10 times and ah, it's, but then the next day they come back and it's changed. And they have no idea how that happened. Right? This isn't a good user experience. Um, you gotta think about these things. So the way, when, when I've used replication like that, when a user was accessing their own data, we always looked at the master. That was the rule. If they're accessing their own data, we always look at the master. If they're accessing someone else's data, if they're looking at someone else's profile, they don't know when they last updated it. They don't know if it's five minutes behind. You know, it doesn't matter to that person if, if the data is five minutes behind, so we're good, right? But if they're looking at their own information, they know if it's been updated. And so they're gonna, they're gonna wanna see that information as up to date as possible. So that was kind of the rule of thumb we used for determining whether we look at a replicated um, version of the data or the master. Now, depending on how your data works and what, you know, what your load is and stuff, one of the big problems is that replication lag. You know, I've had servers that were 
you know, hours and hours behind, you know, sometimes days behind. You know, how useful is a replicated server if the information is 15 hours behind? Even for reporting, you know, let's say you're looking at, you know, at one o'clock in the morning, you run a report for what happened yesterday. And you want to, you know, I want to run this big report on the slave so it doesn't impact the master. You know, that's all well and good, but if your slave is more than an hour behind, it doesn't have all of yesterday's data when you're running that at one o'clock in the morning. You got to think about these things and, and make sure, you know, that replication, like I said, it can help, but you have to think about how it's going to affect your application. You have to think about the consequences because it's going to introduce another layer of complexity. Anytime you add complexity to your application, you, you have to think about that. All right, ORMs. Talk real quick about ORMs. Most ORMs have some kind of debug console or log or something that you can get information out of. Um, you can say, set them to uh, log every query that happens, for example. Um, if you don't have that, or if you want to see everything you know, coming in at once from, every, from your full load, uh, you can use uh, Percona Toolkit's PT Query Digest. If you're using MySQL and you don't have Percona Toolkit installed, you should. Just go get it. It's wonderful. It's like 20 or 30 utilities that just, I don't even know what some of them do. Some of them are totally unuseful to me, but some of them are awesome. There's one for online schema changes. Um, so you don't take your database down when you're changing a table, uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, but one of these utilities is a PT Query Digest, and that's going to, uh, it has different modes of operation. You can either feed it uh, a query log, like if you do, like you said, with setting slow query to zero, you can feed it that. Um, I think it can f take a binary log. Uh, the way I like to run it is actually on the server, I do a TCP dump on port 3306 and put that into a file. And then I can send that to PT Query Digest and it'll parse out the MySQL protocol and figure out everything that happened. And it'll give everything down to you know, the millisecond, you know, how long different queries took, what was happening at the same time. It can get all that information. So some examples of the output you can get from it. Um, here, you know, it's showing, you know, for this specific query, it's giving the query time, how long it was locked, how many rows were sent, how many rows were examined. So rows sent is how big your result set is. Rows examined is how much the database had to look at in order to tell you that it didn't return anything. Um, you know, sometimes you run a query for, you know, a query could run for five minutes and then not return anything, right? So rows examined is a very useful indicator of how good your optimization is. If you only want one row to be returned, then hopefully you're only examining one or very few rows. So based, discrepancies between rows sent and rows examined are where you're going to see problems that you can, you can try to solve by optimizing queries. Uh, here's one, it's showing um, just kind of a histogram of all the different queries, uh, how, how long they took. Um, you know, the 95% of them executed within two milliseconds. The average was one millisecond. Um, the maximum was 698 milliseconds. Uh, median, standard deviation, just gives you all that kind of information. So you got exact time, rows affected, query size, uh, warnings. So. All that is stuff that can help you. Um, oh, and then here we have 1% that didn't use an index. Again, keeping with the MySQL tradition when it comes to indexes, yes is no index, no is yes index. So it goes along with that non-unique thing. Um, so PT query Digest for this one. This report is um, showing 
So it shows you, you notice it doesn't show what was selected, it just shows it's a select and this is the table. Or these are the tables. So if there's multiple tables, it'll show them both or all of them. Um, so it shows you what kind of uh, query it is and what it was. And then, so it'll group them. So all selects on a certain table will show up in the same grouping. And it'll show you response time, calls, and that kind of thing. So it'll, it'll kind of give you a, an overview of, you know, maybe this table is causing me problems and I can look into what queries are happening on that table. And this one is for a specific query. Is saying, well, this query happened more than once, and one time it was 10 uh, nanoseconds, another time it was 100. You know, it's, uh, it's just showing a query distribution how long, how long they're taking uh, for that specific query. So anyway, there's lots of useful information. It gets you, um, anytime you use PT Query Digest, you're going to know more about what's really happening with your database, and that can only help you knowing what's really going on will help you identify where the problem areas are and where you need to focus your efforts. Um, if you're focusing your efforts on optimizing something that very rarely happens and doesn't really cause that much of a slowdown, you're focusing your efforts on the wrong place. You need, in order to optimize your database, you need as much information as possible about what's causing it to have problems. So in conclusion, be smart. Um, like I just said, know what your database is doing. Uh, find out what the bottlenecks are. Break your problem down into, you know, what what is really you know find the pieces that are causing the problem, and uh, just try to attack them uh, one at a time. Get them down as small as possible and try to solve those. And before you do anything drastic, understand what all the effects, you know, the possible effects of what you're doing. You know, like I said, replication has lots of great, you know, benefits if done correctly. Um, but there's also, you know, one of the biggest disadvantages of replication is that your admin has to configure it and keep it all up to date. And, you know, there's overhead in admin time. You know, all these things have to factor into your decisions. So you need to understand exactly what is it going to cost us to do this. Handler socket's great. I wouldn't use it for billing data because it's not a good it's it's not a good use case for that. Um, so you just need to understand what it, what am I doing and you know will this you know what what's going to happen when I do this? What effect will it have? So thanks for coming. Um, that's my information. Uh, leave feedback, let me know how I did, and uh, if you have any questions. Is the slide up there? Um, yes, my slides are on stevemyers.net. The minor change I made after Colin's session um, isn't on there, because I posted them before. Yeah? I have a general question. What's your view on moving some of the more low-level Um, so store procedures, triggers, I, it depends, that, that's a hard question to ask without knowing your data. Um, and it, not just your data, but what, uh, you know, who, the inf more information about your development um, process, uh, you know, how your company works, I mean, all that stuff factors into how you want to do it. Um, you know, if you have uh, dedicated DBAs, then, I mean, the thing is, changing a query in your, you know, if you're using PHP, changing the query in your PHP is easy. Changing a stored procedure is a little more complicated. Um, you know, it's, it's not like it's impossible or anything, but, you know, it just takes a little more work to change a stored procedure than it does to, uh, just update your code yeah. and, and push that out. Right. Yeah. Well, and also, um, you know, when you push out your code, it all goes out at the same time. Um, but if you've got stuff in stored procedures, then you've got to 
you know, you've got to make sure those get updated at the same time to push out the code, otherwise you have stuff out of sync. You know, it, it does introduce some uh, potential problems. Um, those are by no means, you know, fatal problems. Um, if you've got really good DBAs who can really get certain things to, to really, you know, really well optimized, um, then maybe it makes sense. And they can, they, you know, they may not know PHP or whatever language you're using. And so it doesn't make sense for them to go into the code and update queries because they don't know what's going on there. Their language of expertise is SQL. And so let them do their stuff in SQL. Um, you can also run into problems if you have, uh, where you have that more siloed approach where you have DBAs doing store procedures and stuff where developers um, being developers, and I'm a developer too, so I know what it's like, but when you have tools, you use, you know, you, you tend to use what you've got. And so um, if the stored procedure isn't exactly what you need, then you may do things that hurt your database trying to get around what, what the DBA, you know, was benevolent enough to give to you, you know. That, that's kind of a, you know, you, you run into potential problems, um, but yeah, sorry. That's not much of a, an answer for you. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, just understand what's, you know, what, what the effects are gonna be and think through it before you do it, so yeah. Um, if I have a primary key, and, and I try, a couple years back ago, I, Is there any way to have an auto, auto increment key um, updated in your table without having that as a key? Does that make sense what I'm asking? Not automatically, no. We actually have a place where we call a, a table that all it has is one element in it, and we just do a, an update plus one on that and then get the last uh, value out by yeah. select last ID. Yeah. so that we can get what that was and it's guaranteed to be unique every time and then we yeah. insert using that value. Now if you're just, if you update, then that, you could well, end up with conflicts, but if you insert into that table. It's not atomic because it's a select, well you're doing an update uh, itself plus one and then you get what the value uh, with your last select last insert ID or something like right. that. Well, last insert ID only works for inserts. So you have to do it with it. You do it with an insert and then get that. Yeah. Yeah, but there, there are ways to do it with transactions too if, with just doing an update. But it's a little, um, again, it depends on your isolation level and that can affect it. Then anyway, I need to do that. So I need to take that value and then easily add that value to my other table right. before I do what we were discussing earlier. So I need a way to like access that in the database globally. So when yep. I run my update, hey, I can have it in the other table so I don't have to use that. Yep. Is that, could you give me a suggestion? Um, why don't we, yeah. 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 Yep. For his problem, I don't think that would help too much because he's already got a 20 character yeah. unique key. But he's trying to get the index down to an integer if he can. So it's just a matter of putting an integer um, primary key and trying to use that as well as having a unique index. So anyway, thanks. Thank you.